Well, good morning to each of you. I welcome you to Northstone Baptist Church. I want to thank uh, Peyton and Jenna for serving the Lord uh, through our prelude. And uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm in this place already this morning. There is a great spirit that we sense here in this place among uh, so many of you people. And we trust that you've come to this place uh, enthusiastic about this Advent season, excited about Christmas. And so with these things in mind, go ahead and stand with me, please. And let's pray together and help us make sure we've got the right perspective about what is uh, before us. All right, would you bow with me, please? Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. And we recognize that prayer is a humble privilege. We bow our heads and our hearts before you in humility, recognizing that you are our God and we are your servants. And not just your servants, but we are privileged to be your children, to be adopted into your family. And so, Father, we humbly ask you that if there's somebody here that doesn't know you as Savior, they're, they're not one of your children, we pray that today would be the day that they trust you, that they receive Jesus as Savior before it's eternally too late. And so, Father, we pray for the many that are among the family of God. We pray that each of us would affix our hearts on singing your praise, on studying your word, on giving to your cause, uh, on fellowshipping with your people, and that we would do these things recognizing who you are and recognizing who we are because of Christ. We have received your grace, and it is so abundant, and so we sing with zeal, and we study with attention, and we give with liberality, all not because of who we are, but because of who we are in Christ and what you have done for us. So help us, Father, to have a gospel-centered perspective as we worship you here this morning. We sure love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing, please. Take your hymnals, please, and turn to number 124. Number 124, We Three Kings of Orient are. Join me on that first verse. pages to number 122. Number 122, who is ye in yonder stall? We'll sing all six verses of this. It, is, it tells a story, so we need, and it's fairly short, all six verses of number 122.
Spurlock, if you'd lead us in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to join together in this building as your church. Father, we thank you so much for your love. Although we don't deserve your love, we thank you so much for it. We thank you so much that you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus down here to die for our sins so that we could have a home in heaven. Lord, just bless these offerings now and let they be used in a way to be pleasing to you. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Think of that offertory. That was intended so that no matter what sort of mood you came to church in, you had to smile <laughs> at least once today. <laughs> All right, please turn with me to Luke chapter 2 for our scripture reading this morning. Luke chapter 2, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 7 responsively. So once you've found Luke chapter 2, or while you're turning, if you can do two things at once, please stand with me. And we will read responsively, but we're going to start with you all reading verse 1, and I'll read verse 2, and then you read verse 3. And I'll get you started. So Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, all together in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And so it was, that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Thank you. Excellent reading. Please pray with me over this passage of Scripture. Father, we do thank you for uh, the truth that this passage represents, Lord. This is a very famous, uh, very well-known word to, to us, Lord, uh, because it's the birth of your Son, also because it's the Christmas season, Lord. Uh, I, pray that, I pray that the things that we uh, might take for granted, Lord, about about Luke chapter 2 or about the birth of your son, that you would help us today, Lord, to, uh, to understand their significance uh, for us in a new way, Lord. We know that, uh, that your sending your son was, has been a part of, of your plan, Lord. Uh, you've known about it from, from eternity past. You have uh, been working this plan since the fall of man, Lord, to bring it to pass, and we live on the other side of that. Uh, Lord, it's so easy for us to take for granted the gifts that you've given. 
And Lord, if we were to take some time to, to consider what the life of Christ and the cross and the resurrection and seated on the right hand of God and coming again and deliverance from sin, Lord, what all those things mean for us. Lord, we can't help but thank you. We can't help but live a life that's worthy of that. And so, Lord, I pray that you would, through your spirit, would you please teach us this morning about a familiar topic that we must not forget in a new way. And we thank you, Lord, for the presence of your spirit among your people. We thank you for uh, our pastor. Lord, we thank you that we have your man uh, delivering this message to us. And so you've given us everything, Lord. I just ask that you would please give us grace in our hearts to listen, to respond, and to be willing back to you to give you love and to give you obedience. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your songbooks once again and turn to number 118. Uh, number 118, What Child Is This? We'll sing all three verses of number 118. Be seated.
is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. done, Chantel and Jenna. Thank you for serving the Lord in that way. All right, at this time, we'll dismiss the young people, ages four through the third grade. And so young people are on their way out uh, to follow uh, Sister Wasser and Sister Price as they serve the Lord there in the junior church. All right, good. There they go. You know, after I dismiss the children, usually my next habit is to uh, look at that clock and figure out what time I start preaching, uh, because I don't always start preaching at the exact same time, you understand? There's different events, songs and specials and, and things that take place previous to my preaching, so it's a little bit different by a minute or two or five, you know, uh, each, each time, and so I try to calculate. I have, I have a number in my mind of how long... I endeavor to preach on a Sunday morning. I go into this with a plan, okay? And so I try to do the math, and sometimes when I'm sitting here, I forget to do the math. It's a digital clock. You'd think it'd be easier than the analog clock. Anyhow, I'm going to do the math right in front of you right now. Okay, carry the one. Okay, um, <laughs> just kidding. But anyhow, I do have a goal in mind this morning, uh, but Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the study over the last several weeks, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, as we've studied the, the real details of Christmas. And uh, Jesus is the reason for the season, and there's a lot more than just cliches and traditions uh, involved in, in these uh, ideas. And so we are going to study, continue our study, really through the whole month of December. We have uh, suspended temporarily other studies because here we got to Advent season. And so we will resume First Peter in the month of January, but because... Uh, it is extremely appropriate because the Lord uh, directed uh, our attention uh, to these texts. I really want us to be familiar uh, with, with what the Bible says about these infancy narratives. And so we looked at Luke 1, much of it. This morning we're in Luke chapter 2, so turn your attention there. Uh, we will get into Matthew uh, chapter 1 here uh, next Sunday, Lord willing. Another infancy narrative. And I hope with your family you're doing more. Um, you're studying uh, passages like Galatians 4.4, 4, and you're studying passages like Philippians 2. You're studying uh, Paul's emphasis on the incarnation. Uh, so, so be an overachiever. Uh, he is worthy of your attention uh, to study uh, what Christmas is really all about and the emphasis on the incarnation as well as these infancy narratives. All right, Luke chapter 2, we will entitle... Uh, this morning's message this way, and that is uh, found actually in our text. These words are in verse number 7 of Luke 2. The, word, uh, the words are brought forth, brought forth. And what I would suggest is that in contrast to Luke chapter 1, what we've already studied, that, that these first seven verses of Luke 2 are rather ordinary. Uh, again, in contrast to Luke chapter 1, there's a whole lot of extraordinary things that are occurring in Luke chapter 1. Do you recall them? Uh, 
the idea of Zacharias and Elizabeth uh, in their old age having a baby, John the Baptist. It's an extraordinary idea at their age for sure. And then the commission of John the Baptist, this baby, to be the forerunner, the introducer, if you will, of the incarnate God. That's an extraordinary uh, calling upon John the Baptist's life. If you're not impressed with those things as in the extraordinary category, if you're not persuaded, uh, consider the extraordinary angelic visit to Zacharias and the angelic visit of Gabriel to Mary, all of that recorded in Luke chapter 1. So lots of things in the extraordinary category. You get to Luke chapter 2, and I'm going to suggest to you that there's a lot of ordinary things happening in these first seven verses. Brother Kaiser mentioned in his comments that these are extremely familiar, and they are. Uh, and I just want to point out the many ordinary things that are happening in verse number 7. And the reason, the reason that we should contrast, that we should have an understanding of, of what is ordinary and what is extraordinary in Scripture is because, because the, the distinction provides grounds for informed worship. If you know the difference between what is extraordinary and what is ordinary, you will marvel at the extraordinary. You will worship God for the extraordinary things that He has done. And so, um, the point, by the way, of this morning... Um, one individual who texts me every Sunday morning, I appreciate it very sincerely to let me know that they're praying for me. But one of the things they included in their text this morning is that their prayer for me as I preach is that Christ would be exalted. How many of you want that to happen here in this place? Amen, yeah. And I'm just saying it is healthy for us if we're, if we're as a group endeavoring to exalt Christ in the study of his word this morning, it's healthy for us to distinguish between the ordinary and the extraordinary things in this text because, again, it's grounds for discerning what we should marvel at so that we can therefore exalt him uh, out of sincere hearts of worship and adoration for who he is. So here's what I want you to see as we consider the idea of brought forth. We'll see three things this morning. First of all, we'll see an ordinary delivery. Now, some of you are going to be shocked. You're shocked by that point right there. Did you just say, Pastor Johnson? That Jesus' birth is ordinary? Well, in part it is, and you'll see that, I think, in the text. So an ordinary delivery, <clears throat> we'll see secondly, <clears throat> an extraordinary conception. Now, that's the part that we really need to highlight, okay? And then thirdly, we'll see an extraordinary anticipation. All of these elements fall under this major title, this major heading of being brought forth. And again, this idea is in verse number 7 of Luke chapter 2. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So, first of all this morning, ordinary delivery. Ordinary delivery. This idea of delivery um, is the idea of specifically the birth of the Son of God who becomes the Son of Man. And the idea of delivery is at the end of verse number 6. It says that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. This is uh, the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is an ordinary delivery. And so much of what is in 1 through 7 of Luke 2 is again ordinary. And so let me build the case. I would suggest, and I'll give you several sub-points under this, this first point this morning. So, uh, ordinary delivery, the first sub-point is there's an ordinary census, you might say. I say ordinary census because, you know, lots of societies that endeavor to be civilized societies conduct a census. It's a pretty routine thing to do, to take an inventory of people. Um, and the way that they conducted this uh, registration for their census was that individuals would go to their hometown, and every the, the historians tell us that this was done every 14 years. Uh, I think in the United States of America, it's every, somebody was helping me, it's every 10 years. And is the census happening, or has it just happened? It just, yeah. So, because somebody came to the church, um, uh, had information about trying to recruit census takers. Maybe some of you have served in that way, where you go door to door and you give the census to people. And so, yeah, I recall meeting with uh, somebody recruiting for census takers. And so, yeah, it's an ordinary thing in civilized society. 
And there's a regiment that's different in different societies here. Again, the historians tell us every 14 years, uh, but for us, it's every 10 years. And, and so follow along with so many ordinary things in the first seven verses of Luke 2. And it came to pass in those days, in verse number one, the Bible says, there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. The idea of taxing here is not uh, in the way that we think of it, but it is a reference to uh, registering for the census that is to be taken. And this taxing, this registry for the census, was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And did you notice the comprehensive nature of the registry for the census, that all the world should be taxed? I mean, they want to accurately tabulate everybody that's involved. It's pretty normal that that's the goal of a census. Verse number three, and when... Uh, verse number three, and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. So they go to the place of tribal origin. This is the, the conduct, the procedure of the day. Verse number four, and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was a, of the house and lineage of David. Now, that is important for us to understand. Uh, primarily because it speaks of the Messiahship of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, it speaks of his lineage. Um, verse number five, we continue with the ordinary emphasis on the census. Verse number five, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. In previous messages, we've defound, uh, defined the espousal uh, stage. And she was great with child. So here is this young couple. They are espoused. Um, and the fact that during the espousal period, she is great with child, now we start to transition into the extraordinary. All along the way, there's so much that has been ordinary. It's an ordinary census, not only an ordinary census, but an ordinary, by the way, I'm going for C's here, so you'll understand if I say it this way, I, I, and some of you ladies might not tolerate this, but just see me after and um, I'll hold my wife's hand and hopefully I can handle it, you know, whatever feedback I get from this. But I'm going to call it an ordinary carry, okay, an ordinary carry. Notice that she's carrying the baby. Uh, like, uh, you know, I don't mean to minimize, ladies, okay, any of the carrying of a baby to term nine months and the pain and all this. But it says that, the verse number six, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So it's an ordinary census. It's an ordinary amount of time that Mary carries Jesus in her womb. Uh, and then ordinary crowds. Here's another C for you, crowds. I mean, it's a registry for a census. Uh, some people make too much of the end of verse number seven that there was no room for them in the end. Well, it makes sense that it's packed because it's a registry for a census. It's, you, you, there are certain times in Pensacola where there's big events taking place and people go down to that uh, what is that down there, an ice hockey arena or something? And uh, there were a couple Trump rallies over the last couple years. And, you know, if there's something happening in Pensacola uh, and then you're, you're on 110, maybe headed south, and you see cars everywhere, you're not surprised. You know there's something going on in Pensacola. There's hubbub. There's a rush. There are people interested in what's going on. It's kind of ordinary that there would be crowds. Um, and this is uh, something that is essential to, again, their civilized society. And so uh, people understand there's crowds. People understand that the hotels are full. Have you ever went to an inn, a hotel, and tried to get a room on a weekend when uh, something was going on? My son Mark and I got to go to Tallahassee a few weeks ago. Um, and Mark is a terrific cross-country runner, and he is, was running in nationals. And uh, anyhow, we like Holiday Inn Express typically, and we went uh, Friday night and Saturday morning is the run, and we booked our hotel a week or so out, maybe 10 days, but right next to the Appalachian State Park where he was to run, the Holiday Inn Express is full because there are like more than 10,000 people in that area coming for that event. So we found a Holiday Inn Express 25 minutes away from Appalachia. I mean, there was no room for Mark Johnson in the inn. Uh, and and so, uh, so we worked it out. I mean, we shouldn't be surprised. There was an event. Um, and, and so ordinary crowds. There's something going on. Not only uh, the, the content of, of these first seven verses, ordinary census, ordinary carry, ordinary crowds, uh, but ordinary conditions. And I'm describing really the financial state 
of, of a young couple, Joseph and Mary. Um, and, and, and then I'm also describing, you know, that they're poor. We understand that if you've studied a little bit about the culture of the day and, and Joseph and Mary, so financially poor. But the conditions are ordinary in the sense of wrapping their new baby um, in swaddling clothes and, and laying him in a manger. I mean, and the manger does uh, help us see the picture of poverty. Um, and, and, of course, there was no room in the end. So a lot of this stuff is, is relatively ordinary. All right, so, so, so see in the text uh, the ordinary delivery. She brought forth her first born son. A lot of what is in that, uh, those verses is ordinary. The second idea for the morning is the extraordinary conception. Now this is what we marvel at. This is what we praise God for in the Christmas season. Uh, this idea of bringing forth in verse number 7, that which was brought forth is uh, the result of an extraordinary conception. And we studied it previously. Go back with me to Luke chapter 1, verse number 35. Jesus had a human mother, Mary, and yet he had a divine father, his heavenly father, our God. And, and this is references to the conception. It's Luke 1, 35. The angel answered and said unto Mary, notice this, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. This speaks of the conception. The power of the, mo of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. This is what we marvel at when it comes to the Christmas season. Uh, this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14, that a virgin shall conceive. It speaks of the extraordinary conception. And so much of Luke 2, 1 through 7, ordinary. But when you understand that she, that she brought forth her firstborn son, you marvel at it because of the conception. Because of the Holy Spirit's involvement. This is not just another boy born in Nazareth. No, you go back to the conception and that is what you marvel at. You marvel at not just the humanity here, but the divinity. You marvel at the hypostatic union. You marvel at humanity and divinity all becoming one. At least for 33 and a half years. It's extraordinary conception. All right, for the morning, the third and final idea is this, and that is, I want to emphasize the extraordinary anticipation. Extraordinary anticipation. So, I think some of the most beautiful verses in the Bible include Luke 2, 7. Luke 2, 7, we've read it, that she brought forth her firstborn son. That's beautiful. That is the birth of the God-man. It's beautiful. Not only that, but I referred you to another verse that I think is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, and that's Luke 1.35. And that speaks of the extraordinary conception that the Holy Ghost comes upon her. All right? Uh, but, but as you marvel at that which is so beautiful in Scripture, marvel at... It, it, the reason that we should marvel at it and the reason that it's so beautiful is because it was so seriously anticipated. Um, you know, when a child is born today, uh, there is a, a, a certainly anticipation. Um, there is often a reveal party, uh, and people get excited to watch the reveal party, and there's lots of people that do that lots of different ways, you know. Uh, maybe they pop a big balloon or a bunch of balloons and blue stuff comes out and everybody knows it's a boy, or pink stuff comes out and everybody knows it's a girl. Um, have you ever seen those videos on YouTube where uh, the, um, the uh, reveal party goes wrong? I find those hilarious. Some of those are just hilarious. Uh, but, but anyhow, it's just, you know, it's anticipation. And the, uh, the, of course, the mother and the father, they're excited about the baby uh, that is to come. And the grandparents are, are often very excited. And uh, cousins, you know, and aunts and uncles. And, you know, family and uh, immediate and extended family, a lot of anticipation about what is about to be brought forth. 
but the anticipation that, sur that, that surrounds these ordinary circumstances with an extraordinary conception, the anticipation is second to none. I mean, just review with me, and this will be our final thought, our final major point here for the morning. But review with me all the anticipation that leads up to verse number 7 of chapter 2, that she would bring forth her firstborn son. A lot of anticipation for sure. We've already talked a little bit about John the Baptist. And remember, we studied previously that he leapt in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth. He leapt. He's anticipating. Uh, the, it's very likely he, he's leaping, of course, because he has joy and he's full of the Holy Ghost. The text tells us that. But because he's in the presence of the one who he's going to essentially live his life proclaiming. John the Baptist in his mother's womb, in Elizabeth's womb, is leaping for joy because he is the forerunner. He's, Elizabeth is there with Mary. Elizabeth is pregnant. Mary is pregnant. Jesus is in Mary's womb. And, and uh, John the Baptist is in Elizabeth's womb. And in Elizabeth's womb, he is leaping for joy because he, once he is born, uh, he is going to then be the forerunner, the introducer of the God-man. It's anticipation, certainly, on John the Baptist's part, on Elizabeth's part, on Zacharias's part, uh, on Mary, and, and you read Matthew 1, on Joseph's part, anticipation. And I'm saying this is extraordinary anticipation. It's not just John the Baptist, but you think about the shepherds, and we'll study the shepherds tonight later in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 and following. Notice verse 8, there we're in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and then the shepherds are emphasized again in verse number 15, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Uh, traveling involved, there's certainly anticipation on uh, the part of the shepherds. And then not only the shepherds, but think about Simeon with me, if you would anticipation about what is brought forth in verse number 7. Uh, Simeon is later uh, described in Luke chapter 2. Notice verse number 25. See this anticipation. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was a just and devout man waiting. Notice this. This is anticipation for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him anticipation on the part of Simeon. And verse number 26, oh, I love this verse. Verse 26, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So what is brought forth in two, Luke 2, verse number 7, is, is fulfilled and anticipated from the heart of Simeon. This is extraordinary anticipation. And if you aren't seeing the point yet from the examples of John the Baptist and the shepherds and Simeon, maybe, maybe, maybe this fourth idea will persuade you. Um, and that is the hymn that Doc Ainsworth started us with uh, this morning, which was, uh, uh, we sang, we, we Three Kings. You know, the wise men described, the magi described in uh, Matthew chapter 2. If you're following along, would you turn over in Matthew, to Matthew chapter 2? I want you to see a few of these verses. Great anticipation on their part. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Hey, if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, you might circle or underline the idea of king. This is why they anticipated his birth. Where is he that is born king? King of the Jews. For, he, uh, for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. No doubt anticipation in their heart for the king. No doubt hearts of adoration and worship for the king. You continue through the explanation. Look at verse number 4. And when he had gathered all the chief priests, this was Herod gathering the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Again, if you're in the habit of marking in your Bible, maybe circle or underline the idea of Christ. 
Not only is he king in verse number two, but he's Christ in verse number four. Verse number six, the Bible calls him governor. You see that word there. You might underline or circle that word. All the anticipation, uh, you can go back to Luke chapter 2 now, all the anticipation of what happens in Luke 2, 7, that she brings forth her firstborn son. Anticipation from John the Baptist, anticipation from the shepherds and Simeon and the Magi, because they are anticipating that the king of the Jews is to be born and that Christ is going to be born and he is the governor in fulfillment of what uh, Isaiah 9, 6 says about him. And so I'm saying this is extraordinary anticipation, more than just we're having a baby, let's paint the bedroom blue or, or pink. More than just the 21st century kind of excitement and anticipation, and sure, you should have those things. But because of the extraordinary conception, there's extraordinary anticipation. And as you think about this time of the year, as you think about Again, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible that she brought forth her firstborn son. And we all know that's a reference to Jesus. And because, because, not because of the circumstances of the delivery, but because of the circumstances of the conception, we find this season so beautiful. We find that it is in this season that we can rejoice so much the more than we do all year long. Because Jesus came to save sinners such as us. It's a wonderful thing. She brought forth her firstborn son. So, so who was he? Who is he that was born, that was brought forth? Remember, if you know what it means to be saved, he's your redeemer. He bought you. Redemption, it's the financial term. It's purchase, you know. It says in Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, that he purchased the church with his blood. That's who she brought forth, our Redeemer. And, and if you're tracking this, it's kind of a head scratcher, isn't it? I mean, if you're financially frugal, you think of yourself as rather prudent when it comes to money, savvy, you go to rummages, and you, know, and you like to negotiate at the rummage. You know, they uh, got 25 cents on it, but you won't go uh, a penny past a nickel, you know. And you tell them why, and there's a ding and a dent, and, uh, you know, you're not buying that unless the price is right. Who is he that was brought forth? I I'm saying he was our redeemer, and it's a head-scratcher, because, like, why did he purchase us? Is it because we were flawless? Is it because... Uh, we were uh, something he needed. It's, it's, it's startling when you think about it. Um, no, no. He purchased us not because of who we are at all. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite of that. It's in spite of who we are. He is our redeemer just because he is good. And it's during Christmas when you think about Jesus being brought forth you should be mindful that he came to seek and to save those which are lost. He came to give his life a ransom for many. That's the transaction, you understand. That's the idea of imputation, uh, the wrath of God being appeased because he gave his life. The wrath of God against sinners, imperfect people. It was appeased because, Mark tells us, he gave his life a ransom for many. That which she brought forth was our Redeemer. That which she brought forth is our Savior. He saved me. He saved me. And if you know him as Savior, he saved you from eternal hell. Savior. I remember my sister, I have three younger sisters. My sister, Becca, was uh, swimming in a pool. We were kids. I remember jumping in, and she was in the deeper end and, and trying. By the way, you're never supposed to jump into a pool and save somebody, BT dub. You should put out a lifeline or something. But I was her brother, and nobody told me anything, and so I tried to bring her over, and she said to me, I'll never forget it. She said, James, you saved my life from drowning. I'm a hero, right? Don't you love it when preachers tell stories that make them look good? Uh, anyhow, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, saved my little sister in that moment. Look, he saved sinners such as us from drowning, if you will, in the consequences of our sin. 
eternal hell. Who is it that she brought for us? A redeemer? A savior? She brought forth that which was conceived in her of the Holy Ghost, Luke 1.35. These are reasons why we marvel at Luke 2.7. A lot of ordinary things happen there. A lot of ordinary things. But make sure you understand the difference between the ordinary and the extraordinary. And this Christmas season, you are faithful to marvel and worship him for these things. Would you bow with me, please, for prayer? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, do you remember the day that he saved you? Do you remember the day that he redeemed you, where you were converted to Christ? Some people tell me that they've just always been saved. It doesn't work like that. Some people say, well, I grew up in church. That's fine. That's good. But that's not what I'm talking about. When was it for you where you had a salvation experience. The Apostle Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. Have you had a Damascus road experience, if you will, where you knew you were a sinner and you needed a Savior and Jesus was that Savior? If you have, you know you're saved. You have a Bible reason why you're going to heaven. In the quietness of this moment, would you thank God for the day he saved your soul? And in just a moment, we'll have a hymn of invitation. You could come and kneel and, and pray and just praise God for the day he saved you. Praise God for the day that Mary brought forth your Redeemer, the day that Mary brought forth your Savior. Maybe that's what you'll do during this invitation. Or maybe you're here and you're not sure that you're saved. You sure want him to be your Savior. You sure don't want to die and go to hell and face the consequences of your own sin. And so maybe he is drawing you today, convicting you today, and you need to come. and We can have somebody take the word of God and show you how to be saved. Steward this invitation wisely. Would you stand with me, please? As she begins to play, Doc's going to come and lead us. Church, make sure you use this time as a time of prayer and reflection about how the Lord spoke to you this morning. Brother Wasser, would you come to the platform to close our service in prayer? I want to remind you all to join us again this evening at 6 o'clock. 
Uh, we will study the next section there in Luke chapter 2 and marvel at uh, all the details, uh, at, at, at the details in relationship to this, these infancy narratives. And so be with us here this evening. Uh, we so appreciate your faithfulness, church family. I mentioned at the beginning just the sweet spirit and the enthusiasm that is in this place. And so I commend you for that. Uh, and we do want to welcome visitors. I see we have uh, some visitors back here. We're very thankful that you're here. So my wife is back here, and I'm going to be back there in just a moment. And that's our little visitor center. And so if you are a visitor, we've got some gifts for you. And my wife and I would sure love to greet you and meet you in person. Uh, and so I'll be back there in just a moment. All right, Brother Wasser, would you close us in prayer? Father, Father I thank you for a good year to us, Lord. I thank you for showing that goodness by... Uh, coming, Father, and sending Jesus, Father, so that we can know that we can have eternal life with you, Lord, if we simply um, humble ourselves and admit we're a sinner and, and call upon you, Father, for salvation, because you said that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Father. Help us to, during this season, to tell others about that great salvation that you've given us to to be faithful in that process, Father. And we do, with great anticipation, Lord, look toward your second coming. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.